Welcome to the Art Bazaar, a podcast that chats with artists of all types to explore the depths of creativity. Brought to you by the Alternative Gallery. We'll be releasing new episodes every Wednesday with bonus episodes dropping randomly. If you like what you're hearing, you can support this podcast by going to thealternativegallery.com and clicking on the podcast tab. I'm your host, Brandon Wonder, creative director of the Alternative Gallery, a nonprofit arts organization in Allentown, PA, run through the efforts of dedicated volunteers. On this episode of Art Bazaar, we'll be chatting with Andy Greenlee, an artist from Portland, Oregon. Andy is a live event painter who travels the country painting live at special events such as weddings, anniversaries, corporate events, and pretty much any live celebration or event. You can check out her work at celebrationpaintings.com or on Instagram at celebrationpaintings. Andy was also a tenant here at Cigar Factory Artist Studios from 2021 to 2022 before relocating to Portland, Oregon. But she's back in town for a few days and we're fortunate enough to have her come in and record an episode while she's back. Andy, so happy to have you here. Welcome to Art Bazaar. I'm so happy to be here. I love what you guys are doing always. It's an honor. You know, when I heard you were coming back, I had to plan this episode around your visit. Yes. How does it feel stepping back into the building after being gone for, what was it, about a year almost? It's about a year. Yeah. Yeah. It feels good. I love this space. I mean, it's every time I've stepped into this building and especially into my own space up there on the fourth floor, amazing magic happens, you know, not only because I'm creating that space, but because there's something about seeing this historic Allentown landscape, the old mountains of the Alleghenies, you know, in the background and just that nice northern light coming in the studio. It's ideal. Yeah, you have that studio up on the fourth floor, so you get that amazing view and get yes. to see the mountain range around the valley. Yeah. And yeah. your your old studio was still available, so we let you go back in there for a few days. Yes, and you guys always are so supportive of that, and it's it's a privilege to be back in that space. Oh. Love it. Well, I'm glad you're here, and I know you're Thank well-traveled, you. and you bounce around all over the place. Can you tell me where you originally came from and what drew you into the arts? Yes, absolutely. So I'm from the Philadelphia suburbs and my mom was an art teacher. So I was very fortunate that I had sort of an environment that surrounded me as far as supplies and guidance through my mom, who was a trained art teacher. So when she saw that I was interested in the arts and also had a knack for it, she cultivated that in me. She didn't push. My dad was also a teacher, but, you know, elementary school teacher. He was a jock. So we've got the artist and the jock, the Italian and the Pennsylvania Dutch, which is, you know, kind of a classic um, it's almost like tree grows in Brooklyn sort of narrative built into my family. And it's quite the balance, those two. Absolutely. So I've got the gritty, you know, jock side and I've got the soft, introspective, artistic side from both sides of my parents. And my mom really kind of put the tools in my hands and also put sort of those concepts of elements and principles of design into my mindset as an at an early age. And I was able to kind of dip into different local resources as far as Abington Art Center. And then when I was in high school, taking classes at Tyler and more through programs in the summer, youth arts workshops. And so I really had that early advantage, I will say. So it sounds like you've been around the arts for as long as you can remember. Yeah, absolutely. And even when I was in high school and then going into college, which was an arts path, I was hesitant to say I'm an artist. I didn't want to own it, partly because it was like I felt like I didn't want to announce it, but also I didn't need to. It was just kind of always a part of my identity. It was that, you know, the superlatives in high school. You know, I was always most likely to be an artist. It seemed like such an obvious path to me for me, not only because, you know, I had a like a nose piercing and tattoos and my mom was the art teacher, but because it just drawing for me was something that I was that I, I was identified with since I was ultimately in kindergarten when kids would ask me to draw inappropriate things on pencil holders and things like that. So awesome. Yeah. (laughs) So you were the one that did all the, uh, the bad drawings in class. Yeah. I definitely had some incidents where I was grabbed by the ear and pulled down to the principal's office because of some drawings. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. (laughs) Where did you go to college at then? So out of high school, I went to Parsons School of Design in 99 and I wanted to study fashion. I was really interested in fashion. I didn't want to pursue fashion for the sake of ready to wear. You know, I went, I didn't want to like load the the racks with garments that, you know, would become like the trend setting garments. I wanted to tell stories with my clothing. So I wanted to go into more of the path of either costume or couture. And Parsons was sort of like the global leader in fashion. 
So that's where I went to school. I did apply to several different art schools and that was, you know, my preference. I wanted to be in Manhattan. I was this kind of bright eyed, like, I want to go to New York City. That's where I need to be for a design. And I was fortunate that I was welcomed into that program. And Tim Gunn, who's become a celebrity now, at that time wasn't, but he was still like in the fashion world revered. And he was my department chair, which was really a privilege. Uh, I mean, he had like this tiny little Manhattan office in our building and, you know, his door was always open. You know, so, wow. yeah, so that was pretty amazing. Do you keep in touch with anyone from college? I do, actually. Amazingly, my roommate in my freshman year at Parsons lives in Portland now. So she was in the fashion world and then got into sort of like she was doing design and then she got into surface design and then sort of like jumped into craft. So she does these incredible surface design works on her own ceramics and is just hugely followed in that right. But she ended up moving to Portland. And so when I made that connection, oh my gosh, she lives in Portland now. So we've I've reconnected with her and we talk about old Parsons days together. And wow how fashion informs our work now in different what, ways. What drove her to move to Portland? Because <sighs> she was in New York. That's a pretty supportive yeah. city of the arts. Yeah, she's actually from Westchester too. So she's born and raised in the New York area. And she lived in New York for a while after she graduated and continued to work in the fashion scene. But I think she just, I sort of had an early idea of, you know, early sensation of discomfort around fashion because there's always been a side of me that's like, very grassroots, you know, um, wanting to explore, be on the ground level. And then, you know, the fashion is very much about like being aggressive, like on the top level, you know, of just like pushing, being really um, closed off about your work, private. And I think she kind of found that later, that desire to be sort of like in the world, in the real world, making art, you know, and be a real person, not in this sort of isolated, aggressive fashion world. So she sort of like took a big break from it. And her partner is also an incredible designer. He does stop motion animation animation awesome mm -hmm. i should connect you with him oh yes definitely <laughs> you love his work the two of them left new york in this big drastic leap out to portland i don't remember exactly what pulled them now but it's kind of amazing that i'm out there and so like we we've connected again out nice there and well the fact that she was you know a child of the east coast and of the new york area maybe it was just time for a change yeah and kind of having that desire to be an on the ground artist once again mm -hmm. because i mean from the outside looking in the fashion world does seem like a very privileged world yeah it's it's a world of wealth. It's a world of resources. For those that don't have those, they might not be able to be involved. Yeah. And, you know, there's this expression we can identify with out here in the world of arts and especially design, which is the word the word cutthroat, you know, and that's like a word that's often associated with fashion industry. And for someone as earthy and touchy feely as my friend out there is and I am, it just felt strange to be like going after each other's jugulars, you know, and like, yeah. don't touch my stuff. It didn't align with me and it, and it doesn't align with her. So it kind of is amazing that we end landed in this place that's also very expressive and creative that's a lot more embracing, you know, and supportive. Yeah. Yeah. So what were those years like when you were living in New York going to college? Because I'm sure New York was popping off at that time. Oh, yeah. 99 was the year of, oh, my gosh, Y2K is coming. You know? Y2K in the big city. <laughs> Yeah. Last place you want to be. Right. Did you spend New Year's Eve in New York City? No, I always intentionally left Manhattan Every ahead year. of New Year's Eve. Yes. Every year. Yes. Shit show. I, for someone who's always been an extrovert, I've always also had a little bit of agoraphobia, you know, mm. and, and been uncomfortable around crowds. I'm also 5'2". So the idea of being trapped in a crowd of people uh, with no potential for any kind of uh, movement has always made me uncom <laughs> uncomfortable. I always so. wondered, along with other people, where like where do you go and pee? That's the main thing. Because you, you can't, think even, about your you bladder. can't even move. You can't even move. And it's, no. it's New Year's Eve. You want to have a couple of drinks. You want to have some fun. Sure, sure. And then you can't even go rock a piss anywhere. No, none of that. No. no. <laughs> I, I feel bad for everyone that has to endure that. Yeah, there was never a part of me that had any FOMO about that. No. Just, yeah. Watching on TV, if you even do that, is more than enough for me. Right. Yes. That's, so, that's a good distance. What was great about New York back then? Being in Manhattan, being in New York, I mean, there's the boroughs all have different vibes, but being in Manhattan, I think I go back when I can, and I'm hoping to go back soon again to look at some work. There's this really interesting split between feeling really enmeshed in what's going on, but also really lonely. And I think that's really beautiful. Like One scenario that I always love to come across in New York was a scenario of a snowstorm. So you could like the streets would shut down and you can kind of like, I used to have a Walkman 
And I remember I had Edward Scissorhands soundtrack awesome. on cassette. <laughs> Danny Elfman. And, yes. And I would pop that in my Walkman and I would walk around the Lower East Side where I lived and listen to that walking around the snow. That's very cinematic of you. Yes, yes. New York offers those opportunities, I mean, constantly. You can have these interactions with people that are very just vulnerable and immediate and random, which has that cinematic feeling. Like you're always, you always kind of, you know, describing day-to-day experiences in Manhattan can feel like that. Yeah. Uh, those snowscapes were my favorite though, because, mm. you know, you really, people be very playful, excited, you know, and especially the first day of the snowscape is magical. And then you get the sludge, the sludge of like, you know, when the taxi- like It's like a street Slurpee. It turns into a big gray Slurpee. Yeah, yeah it's disgusting. Yeah. And everyone's <laughs> wet to their knee up. <laughs> Classic New York. Yeah. You know, it's got the- Well, I was a New Yorker too for a few years mm. when I lived there working in the film industry. Mm-hmm. So I'm totally connecting with everything you're saying. Yeah. And and maybe it's because I'm a filmmaker, but I did similar things like you're describing with walking around listening to music yeah. on an iPod classic. Mm-hmm. But I placed myself, not so much myself in a film, but I looked at everything like a film, uh, probably because I'm a filmmaker. Did you sure. do the same thing? Like you felt you were living in a film or existing in a work of art? I felt like I was in, so I have a literary mind too. And I think that's why when I think about fashion, I think of it as a narrative tool. And that's why I ended up then later going back to school for costumes specifically and production design, because I love how fashion tells a story. And it's not like I walk around like having this judgment of, okay, this person has this story behind them, you know, but I definitely feel like people express their stories through their, what they wear and in, in a really amazing and beautiful way. And so I think that that was my way of seeing the cinematic element of the city, the way people were expressive, even if it was like the expressive nature of everyone wearing black to like avoid the immediate effects of soot. But yeah, definitely. I think that was there for me for sure. And you worked at one of my favorite places ever, which no longer exists, Mondo Kim's. Kim's video. You worked at Mondo Kim's, right? Is that the only location you worked at? I worked at the Kim's, yeah, at Tompkins Square Park. Mm. Yeah, yeah, magical. So for those who might not know, please explain what Kim's was and what you did there. Ooh, so just to lead into why I pursued that job. Yes, um, please. I worked at Blockbuster Video in high school, and I think that was the first, I mean, I feel like I've worked at many video stores um, when I was younger uh, because I just consumed film when I was young, and I tried to find the most strange and bizarre and deep cut film I could when I was growing up. So when I was in New York, I I was in school, unbelievably intense schedule. And then when I decided to pull away from Parsons studies, I was still in Manhattan. I was like, how am I going to afford this Lower East Side rent? But I had already gotten a job at Kim's Video. And the way that I got the job was that this was in my neighborhood. And I happened to get an apartment in the basement in the lower, like at Tompkins Square Park. I imagine you were already a customer before you got the job. Yes, absolutely. And I remember I interviewed and the uh, appropriately, the manager was very curmudgeonly and definitely a film snob. And he asked me who my favorite directors were. And, you know, that was like his, he wasn't like, what retail experience do you have? You know, or how do you catalog films? It was more like, all right, tell me about your opinions about these directors, you know? What were your answers? I'm curious. I mean, I I definitely remember we got into this heated discussion about Jim Jarmusch for Mm. sure. He seemed to like my answer, so I got the job. I I'm, love Down by Law so much. Oh my gosh. Yes, I have to revisit that one. One of my favorites. Yes. I forgot about that. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. I remember I got that job, and I was ruthlessly sarcastic at that time in my life. I still have that edge, but you know, it was kind of like my only setting for many years. And I remember people would come in, and sometimes people that I didn't realize they were quote unquote, important people, and I would tease them ruthlessly if they would say, I need a membership application. I'd be like, everybody... This person doesn't have a membership here. Are you? I would. I would make a big scene of it. You know, like just this big. <laughs> I think it's very appropriate for New York, though. True. True. Yeah. You have to be teased a little bit, and so, then and then loved on. You get the membership, then you're yeah. in. Yeah. You know, there's no hazing. It's just a little bit of teasing at the beginning. So what? What celebrities, actors, or directors came in that you remember? Definitely Bjork. Okay. I also remember my favorite two are Bjork and. Steven, uh, the lead singer of Magnetic Fields, whose name I don't remember right now, but he's, I, I saw him in concert actually recently. I thought you were going to say Steve Buscemi for a minute. Uh, no. Oh, Which, by the way, did you ever see Trees Lounge, his first? Oh, yeah. Oh, what a great film. Of course. Film. If you were interviewing right, right now for a job, I would 
fail if I didn't say yes then. I definitely, <laughs> I've seen it at least once, I promise you. <laughs> yeah, that's a great film. Yeah. Anybody yeah. else that you remember from Kim's? Those are the two that always come to mind. I'm sure there were more. Did yeah. they do rentals at that place too? Or was they, it just, yeah, I guess so because you're was. doing the, the memberships, yeah. It was all rentals. We even had a porn room. Am I allowed to say that? Of course. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It was a tiny little space, but there was still enough space that they could have a dedicated porn room. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Mondo Kim's was my favorite because on the ground floor, you had the vinyl. Then on the second floor, you had DVDs and it mm -hmm. was international. Mm -hmm. So they had DVDs from around the world. Yeah. And including um, like PAL and different regions. And they would actually sell the DVD players so you can play those. Yeah. And then the top floor, the third floor was all VHS rentals. Right. Yeah. That's the one on St. Mark. So yes. I was in I was in the little smaller grassroots one. That I remember was that one. I've been to them all. I went to every single one. And yeah. Now there's none left. Oh, it's, it's like I know it's super depressing. Yeah, you're keeping it alive though. We're trying. We we <laughs> thought about we've contemplated opening a video store here in Allentown, but the city's really screwy right now, and we just mm. we feel like it's kind of a waste of our time at the moment. Like we mm -hmm. want to keep it in the cards, but True. we're a little uh, bummed by the lack of support for culture in the city. So we're more focused on traveling and coming to see artists like you in Portland and there other cities go. where they're at, right? Yeah, yeah. So what kind of movies are you watching now? You see anything great lately? I'm a little behind the times, but I just read The Killers of the Flower Moon a few months ago. And then everyone said, oh, there's a film coming out about it. So, I, of course, I saw that, you know, after reading the book. I'm and dying to see it. I yeah. haven't seen it yet. How is it? It's brilliant. I like that Scorsese breaks the fourth wall in the beginning and at the end. In the beginning, he has sort of like a sit down with the audience and talks about his passion around this project. And at the end, he even does a little cameo and he's the last scripted part in the wow. film. So that's really interesting. And I feel like it was well cast and the characters were really well portrayed based on the true, the story as it was written in the book. But the book is phenomenal. It's an incredible page turner, even if you're not someone who's going to read nonfiction around our history in this country. I mean, as you should anyway, but it's, it's an exciting read. It's heartbreaking. It's unsurprising, sadly. Yeah. But that's been the most recent bit of film that I've consumed. Interesting. Yeah. I'm going on Wednesday, the day this episode releases. Mm -hmm. I am seeing the new Godzilla film in Ooh. IMAX. Oh, hey. Godzilla minus one and it's in Japanese with English subtitles. Wow. So Gareth, Perfect. Gareth Edwards, the director of the 2014 Godzilla remake or reboot or however you want to call it, he actually said he was jealous of how good it was. And, Ooh, and oh, my gosh. wishes he had made it. That's a huge endorsement. I know. I yeah. know. I'm, he, he just put out a new film as well called The Creator, which I haven't seen, but I'm hearing great things about. But what happened was it came out right during the middle of the double strike in Hollywood. Oh, yeah. So there was like no promotion about it and... It just sure. kind of flew under the radar, so you haven't seen that one yet, have you? Not yet, no. no. What about TV? You watch, are you a TV watcher? You know what? I sort of am. I, ha I do have a little mini space in my home where I can go and work out and have my little quote-unquote cardio gym, so I watch some stuff down there. And I just heard an interview with Roxanne Gay on a show, and she's sort of this outspoken advocate of body positivity to the point where she is very risk-taking with her message. She's written several New York Times bestsellers that are often memoir-based. She wrote one called Hunger about her own story around her body and her sexuality and things like that, but she, she advocated to watch, oh my gosh, this show on Netflix about, it's like naked, what is it, naked judgment or naked please help me here i'm not sure <laughs> i actually ditched my netflix a couple years back oh, i got sick of their understandable shit. yeah well anyway i haven't seen the show yet but for someone who's like very aggressively critical of people who are putting down people's bodies the shaming culture there's a spectator who's watching these naked bodies being exposed through these sort of tunnels and or tubes and the the tubes raise up and they show like the feet then the legs and the person is going to pick someone based on the anatomy that they're seeing and for someone like her to say you know she sees all people of all different body types that are owning it they're so like this is like there. a game show i think so again i haven't seen it so wow. i'm t you're asking me about what i'm watching and i'm talking about something i'm not <laughs> watching but i'm hearing endorsed by someone sure. whose opinion i really respect but i mean uh I don't know. I'm going to check it out because I think it's really great for this country to embrace things that are like less puritanical, you know, as far sure, as the body sure. is concerned. So, And I, I think that entertainment and media has really opened people up to stuff lately. Like we're not so prudish. Mm -hmm. You know, this used to be the country of violence, but sexuality was a no-no. Right. I think now we're coming more and more to terms with that, that it's like 
no, violence is worse than nudity. Yes, yeah. Like, like Europe understands it. Mm-hmm. Like, they'll show nipples on television. Right. No big deal, but mm-hmm. the violence is a thing they're concerned about, which makes sense. Yeah. When I was in high school, I learned about Lenny Bruce and his comedy, and I remember feeling like, you know, reading his transcripts, I was that much of a nerd about it, but just, like, his comedy would touch on how breasts could be shown, you know, if it was on a mutilated body, but not in a way that was more performative or sexual. And I always thought, yeah, what's up with that? You know, well, just, comedians <laughs> just, they usually have these great takes because they do. the way they look at the world, I feel. Carlin's my favorite of all time. Mm, yes. That's my, he's like, that's my Bible. Any, anything Carlin does, like that modern man, it was, I think, his second last special where he does a modern man mm-hmm. speech, which is absolutely incredible. We should edit that into this somehow, just like put a little bit. I wish I could. <laughs> that would probably get taken down immediately. Oh. So how did you get started in the live painting aspect of what you do? Okay, so when I was studying fashion, I was working on the figure. And even in high school, I always felt really comfortable with tackling the challenge of representing the human figure accurately and in a way that was expressive too. Um, And then I went into fashion and I was doing these kind of quick fashion illustrations, which felt really natural and exciting for me. And the figure in fashion becomes an armature for costume and for garments, right? It's just this elongated figure, which is really just like this, like I say, armature or uh, avatar for figure that you can picture yourself wearing this thing. And then when I went into costume design, I, I sort of had to shorten the figure and make it more realistic because characters don't all have this elongated fashion body you know so I had to sort of like revisit my sense of how to compose the figure so I worked in film I was doing costuming and then I went back to school for art education and that kind of tapped into the part of me that's really passionate about social justice and about being with youth and exposing them to art and also art criticism and understanding, not in the sense of like creating an army of little artists, but rather creating an army of people who understood their exposure to media and how a visual eye and the language around consuming visual information would help them to be selective about what they were open to receiving visually and not be manipulated, but be more of a, an informed viewer, I guess. So I got into art education. My parents were educators. My mom, as I'd said, was an art educator. So I then had this graduate degree in art education or graduate studies certification to teach K through 12 art. And I was teaching, but I found that in PA, it was very difficult to find contracted positions. And everyone was saying, you have to move south or move here to kind of look for more job opportunities. But I did teach. I got into a, a private school, eighth grade through 12th grade. And so I taught middle or sixth grade through 12th grade. So middle school and high school I taught. I and mean, that was a really wonderful experience. Then I got into a, a local high school and I was teaching there. And my mother-in-law, interestingly, had been doing these live paintings. So she would go to, like a lot of artists do and have throughout centuries, go to public places and document a scene through a painting. You know, think of like Sacre Coeur, like French artists who would sit out and kind of create these impressionistic scenes just for their own entertainment, maybe then sell their work in an open air space in plein air. And someone had said, will you paint my wedding? That's kind of how it started for her. And she started doing that as a niche business as a result of being asked to do so from friends 20 some years ago now. So when I learned about what she was doing, I thought, that's really odd. Interesting. Okay. I know that it like predates photography to document life through painting and drawing, but interesting as a niche like in the event industry. Okay. And she said, do you want to try it? And this was 11 years ago. I said, sure. Because I'm not only because I have this background in art, but I thought, why not? I'm always someone who's like, I'll dive into a thing. I'll try a thing. That's one thing that I give myself credit for is that I'm brave in stepping into a new role and give it a shot. You know, I definitely experience imposter syndrome sometimes, not so much in in the art world, but in other realms. Like I got back into teaching yoga recently and it's like, ooh, I haven't done that in a while. But I stepped into that space and I found it very difficult because I've painted and drawn from life for decades, but there's so much going on. Not only there's so much, not only there's so much going on in front of you visually to capture and you're, you're supposed to kind of freeze frame it, but in a way that also feels like there's movement in the image, but also there's people talking to you and the music's very loud and there are all these moving parts, but that for that, to manage that, I drew from my background in production design and working on film sets and theater productions that not only the deadline of like, get this done fast, but also being able to work under pressure and under all of these kind of parameters of like, we can be working and it's loud now, everyone be quiet on set as so to speak. So 
I sort of dove into it and there were some learning curves for me to understand how to take my training and all my experiences and work them into this new parameter. But I found that I really thrived in it because I also love being around people. So I found that I could paint, which was very relaxing and soothing, but I could also talk to people and laugh with people and enjoy the music and the whole production of an event, you know, so that's how I got into it. That's amazing. And, you know, one of the things I've definitely learned since starting the gallery is non-artists and artists alike love watching people create. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating to them to get to see the creative process. Yeah, it's true. It's one thing to be doing it, you know, and to think, oh, what's the big deal? This is what I do all the time. But then even I step away, even when I come across someone who's working, I'm always like, oh, I want to watch this person work. You know, exactly. E- even artists are fascinated and drawn yes. towards it. Yes. Even if it's not an artist whose work I would hang on my wall, just the process, watching them think out loud, so to speak, watching them think through their body and creating these marks, turning a two dimensional surface into something greater. Yeah. It's like almost watching their thoughts manifest themselves. Mm-hmm. It's very interesting. And I imagine when you do that, you're almost contrasting to what you might have done in that situation, I imagine. Sometimes I usually do have a nice disconnect about that. Um, when I look at fine art now over the years of doing these, you know, doing these live paintings and I do, you know, I paint live at least 50 events a year. So I'm, and I make a full fledged oil or watercolor painting on site and then I never see it again. That my work is almost always done on site unless it's a commission or it's my own work in the studio. That's a whole different process, but I create these works and then it's, and then there it's gone. I say goodbye to it. So when I go now to, look at fine art in a gallery or in in, in a kind of like a a curated space, I do look at those paintings objectively differently. And I can see, oh, I see, I know how they did this. Whether it be modern art or photorealism, I understand the process. And it's more exciting and interesting to me that even before when I was a trained, quote unquote, trained artist, but hadn't been an oil painter, I was more of a designer. But when I watch other people work, to an extent, yes, I'll, I'll look and think, oh, interesting how they've done this. But while they're working, I'm always just sort of watching them, their body language and enjoying watching them more so than the resulting work that they're marking on the page or on the canvas. It's essentially performance art. Mm-hmm. It is. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And it's generous because it's almost like your meditation is happening while you're being observed. So Interesting. And these jobs, they take you all over the country. Yeah. Yeah. So like, can you kind of tell me where you've been, what those experiences have been like? Yeah, so far I've only really painted live events in the U.S., but I've been to many states and I have had inquiries in far-flung places, but you know, there's a lot of other parts involved, like travel and all the things, but I've traveled all over the U.S. So kind of started this business here in Pennsylvania, where I'm from, and started in Philadelphia and then in New Jersey. And New Jersey is like the capital of weddings, essentially, you know, big production (laughs) weddings. So I painted a lot in New Jersey, New York, Maine, Vermont, uh, the Carolinas. I've got one in Charleston coming up in the spring. I'm very excited about the Florida Keys, New Orleans, Napa, the Columbia River Gorge in Oregon, Texas, a bunch in Texas. And you travel Chicago. solo. You don't have like an assistant or anything like that. I travel solo. I have roped in friends before nice. who have flexibility. I'm like, you want to go to New Orleans with me uh, while I paint a wedding? Just you never like, asked me that. Okay. Well, you know, I got <laughs> next time. Next Andy. time. I got I'll, you fl- I'll fly to Portland just to go to New Orleans with you. Please. Let's, let's do it. We're doing it all. All yeah, right. Absolutely. Yeah. I love bringing people along. It's so much fun. Yeah. It's, it's great because I love to travel anyway. And I also am, you know, I, I pour my heart into my work in my studio and live, but I also pour my heart into my family life. So as a parent, so when I'm in that role, it's like I am, you know, full throttle, on point, present with all the things I feel that I need to do to deliver there. Then, you know, you can get burnt out there. So then I get to go and kind of pack up my stuff and I go to this new place and then I get to paint and work and it's really refreshing. They contribute to each other well. You take off one hat and put on another. Exactly. I'm the same way. I always need a lot of projects. Because yeah. when I get frustrated or bored with one thing, I can just move on to another. Yeah. I don't know if I can just do one project at a time. Sure, sure. So when you, when you go to these places, do you have a chance to explore or is it kind of just job and back home? Usually it's built in that I give myself some time to explore. I always, you know, if I fly to paint somewhere, I will give myself a few days. I sort of have a formula. So say I have an event on a Saturday. Ideally, that whole weekend is dedicated to that event doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes I have an event where I'm based on Friday and then I fly the next morning 
to paint at an event and I just go because I'm still a spring chicken. I'm still quite young. Let's not, <laughs> let's not just announce that I had a big birthday recently, you know, 40 something, but I still feel very young. So I kind of, I can do that kind of like gig here, fly gig the next day somewhere across the country. But ideally I travel Friday, rest, gig Saturday, rest Sunday morning, maybe yoga, maybe sleep in, do a hike, whatever the area allows. And then I'll finish the painting. Monday, I meet with the client, maybe have a meal around it, depending on the client, give them their work. Tuesday, I fly out. Nice. That's like my sweet formula, if I can pull it off. What day was your birthday? It was the 21st, so a couple days before Thanksgiving. Mine was the 14th. We're birthday buddies. Oh, I love that, Scorpio. Yes. I spent my whole birthday editing a podcast episode. How did that feel? Was that, did that feel like a, did it make you feel satisfied to have it um, be? No, because I was, I felt, gl- I felt grateful that I got to work on my own stuff. Sure, sure. But at the same time, I was very hurried in it because I had to get everything ready for that day mm-hmm. and I had to get done in time to go meet with my friends and family to have birthday dinner. Yeah. So it was like kind of a race against the clock, but sure. there were worse ways to spend your birthday. Sure, absolutely. So, but next year, I was talking to my mom about it last night. I'm going to throw a Ghostbusters birthday party again. Oh my gosh. Again? You've done this before? Well, not as an adult, but as a child. Like the first, <laughs> there was like five or six years in a row. It was nothing but Ghostbuster birthday parties. Amazing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and I'm on a Ghostbusters kick again right now. I'm going through watching rewatching the real Ghostbusters, the cartoon, which is surprisingly great. It holds up so well. Amazing. And, and it's, yeah, did Cotty work on that one? No, she did not. <laughs> she did not. No. Check out that episode. Yeah, Cotty was great. She did work on Ninja Turtles though, which was right, my I heard. companion show that I loved in addition to Ghostbusters. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so now you're based in Portland. What what is Portland mm-hmm. like? Portland is. I'm going to say a lot of things that everybody says about Portland, which is that it's like a it's a big city, but it feels like a small town. I went to college after Parsons at Cornish in Seattle. So I have lived in the Northwest before. So I'm returning to the Northwest after 20 years away from it. I lived in Seattle for about four and a half years and on the Olympic Peninsula also. So I sort of like did this city country thing when I was up there. And a lot of my friends fled Seattle after college to move to Portland because they're like, Portland's what Seattle used to be. And this is 10 years ago. And Well, no, 20 years ago, really. And Seattle is very, very different now, but it's been different for a while. It's been evolving. Portland still has adorable neighborhoods with the houses that are all craftsman style, all different colors. Their gardening is like overflowing onto the sidewalks, you know, that little path between the street and the sidewalk that we all associate with just these little patches of lawn they have. They'll have full on raised beds there, you know, fruit trees. And it's so it's it's a very fertile area. It's very playful. People have tours of catios, like the catios people build for their cats to go outside of their houses. That's great. It's such a like a bicycle friendly place. The speed limit's 25 and people actually universally respect that. It's an incredibly safe place to yeah, walk. Yeah, that's a and- big problem out here on the East Coast. Mm-hmm. People drive like maniacs. It's yeah. in The last couple of years, it's become savage here in Allentown. Yeah, I notice every time I come back, I'm like, whoa, that's right. But I mean, I still have the East Coast drive in me so I have to kind of like tone it down out there but when I come back I'm like no don't flash your lights at me to move out of the lane please so do you're not think a cop. they do it right in the west coast as I far do as that? Yeah. I do it's so much safer there's a lot less rage yeah. in general in general and I don't feel like it's toxic positivity either because I have a real like I get real cringy about that too yeah, yeah, I feel yeah. like people need to be real if they're frustrated <laughs> but if you're pissed off Sometimes it's best to let it out. Let in it the out. right in the right way, of course. Yeah. Don't start yeah. chucking change and shit out the windows at someone, you know. Yell yeah. a little bit, just keep going on with your day, it's fine. Right. I'm curious, when you were living in Seattle, did you ever visit Portland? I had gone to Portland, but only a couple times. I yeah. didn't really get to like settle in. To peel back the layers. Right. And that's how Portland is. I feel like a lot of cities you can go to and you get you can spend a couple days there and you're like, okay. I got a pretty good sense of the city, you know, like the, the big hot spots are pretty obvious. You're like, I go here and here or this neighborhood in this area. And I have a really good sense of like the best parts of it. Portland, you have to kind of spend some time. How much not time? because it, not because it's not obvious at first why Portland's great. It's not like, I don't get it. What's so great about it? It's pretty, you feel pretty good about it quickly, but it's really a local kind of vibe there. You know, it's really about neighborhoods, communities. I mean, where I live in the Northeast of Portland, I'm in the city. You can go in any direction and you find all these different kind of communal spots or pods, areas, hubs of creative and culinary activity. I mean, the food is amazing. I remember thinking, oh, once I go to Portland, I'll be really you know, healthy, which I am, but I also eat 
so much good food out there. Thankfully, I cruise on my bike. My husband rides his bike to and from work there. It's another thing. It's it's so easy to kind of get around on a bike. So you're burning off this incredible cuisine because Portland is the place for foodies for sure in this country. I am certainly a foodie and I mm-hmm. chase that around wherever I can. Now, yeah. an artist going to Portland, how much time would you recommend they stay if they could to really get the feel for it? I would say, I mean, any time of year is is great. The winter is more challenging. It's like notoriously rainy, but there's a lot going on. A lot of artists feel like that's their time to kind of buckle down and have interesting creative events that they host. I'd say take a long weekend because one thing that's really great about Portland is that it's so close to waterfalls and incredible, exciting nature. So you can take an hour and a half drive to the coast and you see where Goonies was filmed, you know? Hell yeah. Yes. And then, or you can go 25 minutes in the other direction and you're in, you're in these, this Columbia River Gorge where this big, beautiful Columbia River and there's waterfalls. Or you can go a half hour in the other direction and you're in wine country if you're into that Pinot Noir, you know? So it's not just about the city. The city is a great basis for culture and the arts. I mean, and you can get into anything, anything you're interested in as far as like your aesthetic or your style of music, you'll find your people there pretty fast. My favorite thing about Portland, bar none, is how friendly people are. People are friendly in Seattle. When I lived there, though, I felt like there was this definitely this surface level. People are polite. It was artificial. Yeah. Portland people are like legit helpful and kind and warm. And that's my favorite thing about living there is that everyone is friendly, open, down, down to hang, down to get to know you. So you can not only can you say if you say, oh, I'm really interested in BDSM or I'm really interested in Rocky Horror Picture Show culture. or How about about the jazz? jazz, How about the jazz? Jazz. Yeah, that's my thing. Absolutely. If you're interested in jazz in my neighborhood, there's a spot that's only like 10 blocks away and they have amazing jazz. And those people will you'll feel welcome going in there right away. It's not like I got to size you up, make sure you're like legit and you know your thing. No, none of that kind of. Is it like modern jazz or is it like traditional jazz? You can kind of get it all. I mean, nice. I like traditional jazz. My, Me too. My partner's more into like jazz fusion and funk. There's that too. So I it like jazz on, funk, but you know, the New yeah. Orleans jazz, that's that's my thing. And mm, yeah. Aside from going to New Orleans, you can't really find it too many places. True, so. true. Portland's definitely on my list of places to visit. Maybe I'll get there next year. The Alternative Gala started traveling this year. Kind of the end of last year, we started with Miami. Mm-hmm. We went to Art Basel last year, which was really cool. Cool. We went to Asheville this year. That was really interesting. Have you been to Asheville? I have, but I remember when you were planning on going and I didn't get to hear how that went. It was, well, it was both interesting and odd because the first day I was there, my dad passed away. Oh, that's right. The first day of my trip, so that put a damper on it. Yeah. And we... Sorry. Yeah, you know, it it is a shame and it it definitely affected the trip, but we made the most of it and... Mm -hmm. For me, what was odd about Asheville is that I felt like we were there too late. Mm. Like a few years prior, it probably would have been more what we were looking for. Okay. I think the development kind of pushed out a lot of the stuff that we were yearning for. Sure. I mean, there was live music everywhere, which was cool, but I think the music was actually a little overwhelming because everywhere you went was a music venue. Mm, every like single Nashville. place every single place you went so mm. it was i mean it became not special after a while mm-hmm. you know i know i know that's odd to say because new orleans is like my favorite place and that's all music too but it's yeah. i don't know i feel like it's it was a kind of different approach to it in Asheville. Mm-hmm. like i feel like there was more of a commercial aspect like you would even just go to get a beer in a store and in the back would also be a music venue mm. mm-hmm. and it's like all right well how many venues do you need on one street this is kind of crazy it's overwhelming Right. So I feel like overall what happened is the artists made it cool and mm-hmm. the developers priced out a lot of the artists. Interesting. So the visual yeah. artists, they were the ones that were kind of screwed. We talked to some visual artists we met there. They couldn't find any studios for less than like a thousand dollars a month. Oh. Yeah. The the cost of living down there was extremely high. Wow. The housing was very, very expensive. We have some places when it hit next year. Going back out to LA next year, I haven't been there in a, quite a few years. My buddy Mark, who was the uh, the writer we talked about back on episode five during the writer's strike, he's mm-hmm. out there. So hoping to link up with him and some other friends. But I know you're well-traveled here in the United States. What other cities do you recommend artists need to check out? Ooh. 
I think that when I was living in, I lived in New Mexico for a time, which I know people associate with a specific kind of visual art. So, you know, and people often think of Santa Fe and Taos, but Albuquerque was really starting to evolve as I was living there and as I was getting ready to leave, which was about 15 years ago. And I have been back to Albuquerque since. And Albuquerque has like this really interesting grittiness, a grittiness that when I think of Philadelphia, which is, you know, I mean, I'm from the suburbs, but ultimately I'm a Philly girl. I think of grittiness, you know? I mean, we have gritty. Gritty's the mascot. Yeah. You know, they, the they're flyer. right on the nose of that one, yeah. <laughs> right. They knew what um, they were doing. My friend earlier said the word, it just kind of accidentally came out of her mouth. She said, um, what did she said gritty, but she said groovy. It was like, mm, I'm trying to think. She she came, I'm trying to think of what it was by the end of the, our talk. But okay. she came up with a new word that was like the combination of groovy and gritty. Goovy? I don't know. It wasn't that. It was did something she, sounded much cooler than that. Did she say it by accident? Yes, she did. And I was like, that's it. The gritty gritty and groovy. We need that hybrid word. But that's how Albuquerque is. It's like Albuquerque is, if you go to Santa Fe and Taos, there's, you know, it's beautiful. You have these adobe houses that are legitimately adobe. You know, you go outside of Santa Fe and there's faux adobe, which is, you know, wood with like adobe aesthetic on top, right? Veneer of adobe. But... Albuquerque is not trying to put out any pretenses. It's, you know, it's a, it's a college town. It's sprawling. It's rough. It's dusty. There's great street art there. Really good street art. There's a lot of um, sort of edgy performers because it's like a lot of creative hubs adjacent to or in cities that don't have this immediate identification with the arts. There's like room. It's not expensive to live there. So artists are drawn to those spaces. You can get a lot of people together who are creative and sort of like make art, put it out there. And New Mexico is weird enough that it embraces it and no one's going to push it down. Also, New Mexico used to have this booming film industry. I don't really know where it's at right now because I'm not in that world, but that's where I was at, you know, 15 years ago in IATSE in the film union doing film out there. So there is this support for the arts inherent in the landscape. So Albuquerque's really cool. You already said New Orleans. New Orleans to me is like such a go-to for just being a pedestrian and consuming the all the senses around, you know, all the aesthetic senses. So taste, smell, sound, visual, all of it, you know, you kind of get a little, like a whole smorgasbord of, of sensations in New Orleans. Yeah, it's like an uh, overabundance of culture. Mm-hmm. The Mardi Gras Indians, which I have unfortunately yet to see in person. Mm. But the fact that it exists. Yeah. I mean, come on. Yeah. That's real culture. That's right. And that's a problem with the East Coast right now is because, you know, Allentown and Lehigh Valley, we're essentially getting absorbed by the New York metropolitan area. Right. Essential what's happening in the Lehigh Valley is we're being turned into a suburb of New York and Philadelphia. Yeah, but without transportation to either. And without any real art or <laughs> culture. It's like, you know, we traffic has gotten so much worse in the last couple of years here in Allentown. And it's like, mm -hmm. it's frustrating. Because it's like, if I'm going to deal with traffic, there better be a good reason for there to be traffic. There's not. Yeah. It's like, where the hell are these people going? Right. So, and now all the artists are getting pushed out. Like, you know, yeah. you, you relocated to Portland, Oregon when you moved out of this building. Most artists that leave this building, they're out of the valley afterwards. Yeah. I'd say 75, 80%, not even an exaggeration. Maybe mm -hmm. they go to Philadelphia, but they're either going to New York, Philly, or a lot of artists I know are going to West Coast now. Yeah. Why do yeah. you think so many artists navigate towards the West Coast? What draws them there? Well, I was, I was grateful to be brought out there via my partner who got a great job out there but I was sort of like also pushing like let's move to a new place let's try it that's also my personality I've lived in different parts of the U.S. and I sort of get the itch sometimes like, sure it's time to go and and also in this case it was like time to go and show our kids a new landscape so we we did it on a big scale with a family in tow um in this case but I'm sort of an assertive extroverted go-getter person that's part of my personality but I'm also really laid back and I want to take my time. And I, want, I need to be in an environment that allows me to do that. Otherwise, I'm going to be in the grind. I can very easily get sucked up in the grind and feel like I'm going to be a part of the grind and just go, go, go. That because Just because it is inherent in me. So I need to put myself into an environment where I can slow down. And I feel that being out there, at least in my, my little world I've created in Portland, I do slow down. I take my time. When I'm painting, I slow down. And I can do that anywhere. And I do do that wherever I paint, I slow down. So now that I live in an environment that honors and respects sort of a slower pace, it nourishes me in those other areas of my life when I'm not painting actively. Interesting. And mm -hmm. what's, because I know you had a studio here, what's your studio situation like in Portland now? 
So I rent a space from a man named Ken Uncleese. He owns five buildings in Portland. It was really hard to get in, but I had the great opportunity. It kind of came across the right person who name dropped me and I got sort of on top of a waiting list for this one big building called Northwest Marine Arts. Uh, They host huge events. It's a really big marine building that was turned into an art space. So they have a lot of studios in there of all different sizes, but they also have a big open space that people can put installations or performance art events in. I had been renting a space in there that was really large for me and I was going to share it with my partner, but his nine to five job location moved. So he wasn't so close by to do his project. And I realized this is more than I need space wise. So I just actually just recently have moved into a smaller location on my side of the river. There are two rivers in Portland. There's the Willamette and Columbia. And the Willamette runs right through the city and there's all these really cool bridges, so many bridges from one side of Portland. That sounds like a Native American word. Willamette. I imagine it is. Yeah. And so now I'm on the other side of the Willamette where I can ride my bike to the studio. It's a little, tiny little space, but perfect size for me. Still with Ken Uncleys. So I'm happy. Yeah. But I got to say, like I said to you earlier, when you welcomed me back into my old space, it's not like here. It's it's not my studio here in this building, it Cigar Arts building, it's was the best. I mean, just going back in there, there's something about the beautiful light, the northern light on that side of the building, especially the big windows, the distant view of these old mountains and then the row homes. Yeah. You know, and the rooftop. Yeah, we're, and that's what that's what I love about our neighborhood is we're in a real neighborhood. It's real. It's not yeah. a commercial district. Mm-hmm. We start at the gallery at 9th and Hamilton Street, right in the middle of everything. Right. And we got forced off of Hamilton Street because no one wanted to support the arts and everyone had dollar signs in their eyes because of the arena that mm-hmm. was supposed to be built there. And we were terrified and upset to have to leave Hamilton to come here. Oh, we waited all this time and finally the people are coming and we have to leave. Yeah. In the end, I am so grateful that we did. Mm-hmm. Because first of all, it pushed me back into the neighborhood, which I literally grew up in. Yeah, amazing. My grandfather used to work on the third floor of this building. Who is He's still alive. I was just hanging out with Pop last night. Aww. And yeah, it's a real neighborhood. And yeah. if you see how the neighborhood was originally designed, all the houses built around the building, that's where the workers from this building used to live. Yeah, that's right? incredible. Yeah. And I look at that neighborhood. Why wouldn't you utilize the neighborhood for the same purpose in the same way? Right. The people that live around the building should have some kind of connection with the building. Yes. Work there, associate it with it, come out for events. Yeah. So that's what we're trying to do because over 80% of Allentown residents, they have to take jobs outside of the city because there's so few jobs here. Sure. So we're forcing everyone to have cars, which, you know, it doesn't enable us to have an environment like Portland mm-hmm. where we can have 25 miles an hour and actual bike lanes. Our city is no longer walkable. Well, we at least want to make our neighborhood walkable. Yeah. So I love the fact that we're in a real neighborhood. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's something really special about this building. And we're very 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 lucky to be here. Yeah. It's odd because when you were here, you were here during a transition, a worldwide transition during the pandemic. Because we were, I think we had maybe just started doing live events when you first moved in or shortly thereafter. Yeah. And now you've come to us again Mm -hmm. during another transition where we're kind of taking over more of the building and come January, we're launching this resident artist program and we're bringing a whole slew of new artists in this building. I'm so excited for you and for anyone who can get in here. I mean, I tell people all the time just how incredible this space is and how incredible you are and your efforts and just this community. I mean, honestly, yeah. Well, yeah. and you experienced it firsthand as an mm-hmm. artist that wanted to come here, but how much of a pain in the ass it was to get in here because of the New York real estate company. Yeah, so, I I came into this, I, well, I saw pictures of the building. On, I was like, maybe I should get a studio because I was trying to paint in like part of my loft bedroom and in my farmhouse. And it was like, I have so many works at going on at once. It's a mess. I don't want the animals or the kids to touch my work. And I also want to be able to just have a dedicated space. I don't have to clean up all my paint supplies every time just so we can do another fun, have another function of in this space in our shared home. So I needed a dedicated space to work. And that's when I started looking and I found this building and and you guys, I knew about Alternative Gallery, thankfully, but I found this building and I was like, I want to check it out. So I made an appointment that happened quickly. But once I saw some of the spaces, I was like, I'm ready. When do I move in? What do I need to do? Um, Give me something to sign. Here's my checkbook. Can I? And it was like, 
oh, sure. Okay. You're interested. Okay. We'll, we'll get back to you. And then you, you know, you, then we'll set up a time for you to come and fill out paperwork, to run a background check, da, 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 da. And it was like pulling teeth. I'm like, I am ready to pay rent and move in here. And I was so agitated, you know, I was ready to work and it, it took a little while. And then I eventually called you and got right to the man who gets things done. Thank you. Yes. Oh yeah. And then you got me into the space and it like just immediately felt so good for me to be painting in here. Yeah, and you were a perfect fit for this place. You know, you had the right personality. You, as an artist, understood the importance of the community here, which Mm -hmm. some people, we've had tenants in the past that weren't good neighbors, that weren't good tenants, that they're more concerned about their thing and screw what else is happening in the rest of the building. Yeah. Which that doesn't, if you do that, you're going to make everyone's life difficult here. Mm -hmm. And we don't need that here. Right. You know, that's kind of a reason why we're starting the resident artist program is to subvert all those issues that young artists and emerging artists are going through trying to get a space. Yeah. First of all, they're asking for like way too much money in some cases for a security deposit. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, we have this one artist, a friend of mine that wants to rent a studio for six months. Mm -hmm. They want six months security deposit, basically. Oh, it's like, oh, come on, man. Like, yeah. who the hell has six months security deposit <laughs> just sitting around, especially an artist? No. So it's yeah. made it very, very difficult. I mean, we're now almost in December. I have artists who put in applications in May and June that still are waiting on an answer. Oh, no. So they're at the top of my list for these new resident artist studios that are going to be available to them. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a way for us to avoid a lot of those issues. Yeah. And we've learned from artists like you have had to go through that. Mm-hmm. And that's why I want people to hear from the artists who've gone through it. It's not just us saying that, oh, we need things to change for these reasons. Mm-hmm. If you didn't get in, what would you have done? Where would you have gone? Do you know? Did you have a backup? I didn't really. Not Especially not here. Mm. I mean, my home was only 15 minutes from here, so I wanted to stay local. I didn't want to have to go to... Bethlehem or Reading, and even those areas didn't really have a lot to offer me. But I really wanted to stay right in town. And what was cool about about finding this building, and then when I could get in here, was like this is cool because I had bad feelings about Allentown before I moved into this building. Wow. Yeah, I was like, Ugh, Allentown. Just I don't know what to say. I don't know. But then I got in this building, and I was like, I love Allentown now because mm. because of this space. Aww. I mean it. I yeah. appreciate that so much. You yeah. know, that's that's both heartwarming and heartbreaking because mm, I, I, I was a big champion of the city of Allentown. I know. Every, was? I, was, yes, was, definitely. Mm. Because the city has just pulled too much bullshit with me. Yeah. Especially this current mayor. He just kind of dicked us over from being a part of the Arts Commission, which is, yeah. Big mistake. S- huge mistake. Yeah. Now we're no longer doing Arts Fest, so we pulled out doing Arts Fest. So the city's mm. going to suffer. The artists are going to suffer. It's like we are going to take our efforts where they're appreciated. Yeah. So we're that's why we're going on the road. Like we're going to we're still all in on this building. This is we're treating this like headquarters. We're yeah. bringing a ton of new artists. We're going to keep hosting events. None of that's changing. Mm-hmm. But the whole collaborative approach of us trying to do things in the city and pull the city together and make this a place of art and culture, mm-hmm. it's been it's been made very clear to us that the city does not want this to be a place of art or culture. Right. And what I think happened is the powers that be in this city kind of got so annoyed at everyone saying Allentown is ghetto that mm-hmm. they're like, well, we'll show you. Right. And try to make it overly Manifest corporate. Destiny. Oh, yeah. It's like overly corporate right. now. And it's like not working for anybody. No. It's not working for the businesses downtown. It's not working for the residents in the city. It's certainly not working for the artists. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate that we can't work together at this time. We will try to revisit that in the future, but yeah, it's really sad because I'm I'm born and raised in Allentown. Mm-hmm. And for a long time, I was the only person that seemed to give a shit about this city as far as the arts. Yeah. We're being told we don't deserve a place at the table. It's, That's it's awful. unforgivable. It should be, they should be turning to you to be the guide for guidance about how to bring art. Because cities, cities die when they don't have visual and performing arts culture. It's a fact. I every, mean, throughout every history. Thri- every thriving culture in history had... A large support of the arts. Yes. It, it, it wasn't just for the tourists. It was, hey, what you do is so important. We're going to support the shit out of it. We yeah. don't get that here. We don't get Everyone, it. Everyone, whether they have any creative inclinations or, or eye or training in the arts, wants that in their lives. Music, visual art is everywhere. It's abundant. People need it. Human beings need it. Yeah. 
and yes yeah. <laughs> and, and that's and that's the thing like I like I said earlier artists are getting priced out of the area and yeah. we can't retain our artists so for me like we need to go on the road and see where things work and mm-hmm. why they work and try to make this area better mm-hmm. maybe not the city at large but definitely my neighborhood yeah because the neighborhood is very supportive of what we do they're incredibly supportive because this building since it ceased to be a cigar factory back in the 60s has been many things yeah and none of those things were very positive for the neighborhood based on what neighbors who have been here for decades have told me sure the one neighbors out back they lived here for 27 years Mm -hmm. i mean they tell me constantly how grateful they are how they sleep better knowing that we're here because before we showed up they were selling crack on a loading dock out back Mm. because no one cared no one yeah. cared to tell you not to do that. Right. right. But we did. Mm-hmm. We and we don't we don't advocate and support that kind of behavior because this is really important. Yeah. And it's like our parking problem here is actually what saved the building. Because if we didn't have the parking problem, this would have been turned into apartments. Wow. And if this yeah. were an apartment building, do you think it would be anything special or significant? No. I mean, and where would those people work? I know. We kind of <laughs> lucked out. We really lucked yeah. out. So we're yeah. trying to get artists in these houses and stuff like that, which mm-hmm. we were doing pre pandemic, but I have faith that we'll get better. Yeah, you know good. we're we're trying to roll with the punches and keep it going. But every time we kind of fall on our face, we try something new. Mm-hmm. So we are bringing our animation festival back next year. It's going to be over at the Emmaus Theater in awesome. July, and we're going to do a bunch of pop up art shows. Now, let me ask you this: How can we work together, you and I, to bring the Alternative Gallery to Portland and do a pop up art and maybe performance event? How can we make that happen? I think that can easily happen, especially if I connect you with Ken, because he has the same kind of vision that you do about supporting art artists by creating a space for them to work and to work together in a communal way. He also is a big advocate of newsletters and tools to kind of connect people with what each other are doing. So I think you guys connecting, he has a lot of spaces. He likes to welcome people coming in and planning things like that. So I could easily put you guys together and I, I would love that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because I feel an obligation to my artists, and it's not working here. So mm-hmm. I want to, I want to do right by them and take them on the road. Yeah, and also it's cool because you're getting out of town, and then you come back with a fresh perspective, and you're definitely. always excited about what the next adventure is going to be. Yeah. So speaking of that, what's your next adventure? Where are you going next? Oh, my next adventure. Um, as far as traveling, or just like in my creative world, both either. Well, I so I have a little bit more time here in PA and then I'm going back to Portland and I have uh, a project where I'm going to be doing some paintings for a client base. We're celebrating a work anniversary on a boat. So I'm going to be traveling down the Willamette creating portraits of guests, which will be really fun. That's awesome. I have done that before in Manhattan. I was on a cruise, like a small kind of like city cruise, sunset cruise around Ellis Island um, doing some paintings, which was an interesting challenge to paint on a moving boat. But I love to be on the water and I love to be on a boat. So it was kind of like yet another uh, another avenue for me to combine things that I love into the arts. That's an upcoming project in the next couple of weeks. I have a series of paintings that I'm going to be doing and that I've already started on that I want to start touring and showing too. It's been hard to kind of create my own body of work outside of the event painting and the family running of the family aspect of my life. But I do have a series of portraits, but also these kind of introspective uh, photorealistic paintings I've been working on. So there's that. Those are kind of like the main things that are right in my forefront right now. So. I remember when you were just getting ready to leave here for Portland, you were telling me how you were taking on so many jobs mm-hmm. that you didn't have enough time to create your own work, but you were trying to get back to that. Yeah. It seems like the jobs keep coming, huh? They do. I mean, and well, that's a good I'm thing, grateful though. for that. Yeah. And it's pretty much all word of mouth, I imagine. It is. It is. And it's really growing. I had such a huge network of people that I worked with on the East Coast. So I'm having to sort of rebuild that out there and also rebrand myself in the aesthetic of the East or the West Coast, which is like, it has a, there's a certain, a different kind of aesthetic, different kind of vibe. But I will say, speaking of aesthetics, I feel like Allentown's artist aesthetics that I see here out of the building and just in the area would really be well suited to Portland. People love street art. People love pop art. People love sort of free form stream of consciousness works playful works subversive work out there so i think it'll really do well i feel so many of our artists they would connect well with west coast audiences but are stuck on the east coast but especially portland because portland is famously quirky and and weird in ways that i I think allentown also gratefully also are sure quirky and weird that sounds amazing we'll definitely have to come out there and i'm serious about that maybe we can maybe i do the first trip as a fact-finding mission and just Mm -hmm 
feel, get the lay of the land and, you know, get the feel for things. Yeah. I'm very excited because I want to travel a lot, you know. But, yeah. Uh, you know, you know what I was doing earlier. I was up there power washing the roof because I'm fixing the roof. So yeah, it's a lot of work taking care of this place. Absolutely. And it's prevented me from getting to travel and explore the way I need to. Not that sure. I would like to. I need it. Sure. I need it. If I get stuck here another year, I'm just going to. I'm going to disintegrate. Who knows? It's going to be bad. I'm going to get the Thanos snap. I'm going to turn into a pile of dust. <laughs> yeah. And and people can, they can commission work from you as well. Absolutely. How does, yeah. how does one go about that? So I have a website, celebrationpaintings.com. And through that website, I have portals for sending inquiries to me. And I, I don't reject any inquiries. So there's, you know, if you, if you're like, well, I don't know if she'll do this kind of work, uh, event work or or commission work where it's seated work where I'm painting from life or from photographs. I'm pretty flexible about negotiating and discussing a project with people. So that's a great way. I'm on social media too, but I'm like kind of just not quite a millennial. So I'm, you know, I have, I have a presence there, but you can find me out there and DM me, you know, through Instagram and Facebook and sort of TikTok. I cringy a little about TikTok. You know? Yeah, you don't have you don't have to be nice about it. Social yeah. media is a little frustrating. It's a bit. Yeah. And you know, it sounds like you and I were more interested in real life. Yes. Than the digital life that For a lot sure. of people are kind of stuck in. Yeah. And maybe they need to do more traveling like you do. Hey. Get, get out, out there. there. Yeah. Go on a boat. Turn your phone off. Put it leave it behind. That's Just right. Be in the moment. So as a closing thought, do you have any advice for young or emerging artists that can maybe help them get to where you've been able to get? Yeah, I would say don't be afraid of trying to make a living. You can do it. When I went to school and was studying costuming, fashion, I had to really hustle and it was cutthroat, as I'd said before about fashion, especially and costuming. But I just kept myself open. You have to be ready to talk to people. That's a hard thing for a lot of artists, especially artists who are not extroverted and aren't comfortable talking to people about their work and about themselves. But you have to kind of get out there. And I think the pandemic made it a little awkward to just be a little more whimsical and get out into public situations and check things out. But you got to kind of get out there and talk to people, connect with people. And you might find that you can find a way to be an artist, use your creative voice and find a place for you to show that and get some greenbacks on the other end of it. What do you think the benefit is of artists being surrounded by other creative folks? Artists are inherently good at networking, whether they are, again, social or not, because being an artist means you can embrace being lonely, but it also means that you can embrace showing your soul. So I think that that's a great understand have that understanding about the reality that you're going to need some time alone you're going to need to check out do your work but also showing that work will help you connect with other people and i think that that's a great way to then want to collaborate and sometimes those collaborations have no monetary relationship with each other or you at all but often they will lead to those things so be open to it i agree that's really great advice and again, we've been chatting with artist Andy Greenlee from Portland, Oregon, who specializes in live painting at various events, as well as creating her own works when she has time. <laughs> and once again, if you're interested in checking out her work or even booking her for an event, you can do so by going to her website, celebrationpaintings.com, or I guess the email address direct is andy at celebrationpaintings.com. Is that the best one to use? Yeah, Andy with a Y. And make sure you check her out on Instagram at Celebration Paintings, and sometimes on TikTok. Mm -hmm. Lots of great stuff. You can see what she's up to. And hopefully we get to go out there and see Andy in Portland sometime soon. That's definitely going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Come on. Let's go. Thank you for being here, Andy. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And enjoy your last few days here in Allentown before you head back to the West Coast. I will. And we'll see you soon. See you soon. See everybody. 